Hello everyone, I welcome you all to this live session by Scalar Academy. And uh, today is a Saturday, but uh, whoever has turned up for this live session, I appreciate that you do want to devote your time to upskill yourself even on a weekend. So that is uh, really appreciable. Uh, so folks, uh, whoever is attending, just give me a quick confirmation in the chat if you can see me properly and hear me properly, right? Just give me a quick thumbs up if everything is proper and then we can start off. So let me also verify at my end as well, if everything is proper or not. Okay, so it seems like the audio and video is proper at my end. That is great. Adrish gives a thumbs up. Awesome. Um, so folks, the agenda for today's session would be to get all of the fundamentals of Java programming sorted. So in this session, we'll be uh, learning how to work with basic data types, variables in Java. Then we'll work with operators. Going ahead, we'll see what exactly are arrays and how to work with arrays in Java. Going ahead, uh, we'll also be performing a bit of object-oriented programming with the Java. So everyone in the chat, just give me a, uh, just let me know how many of you know basic fundamentals of Java? How many of you already know Java? Ankush is asking, how are you, Ankush? I'm great. How are you doing? So folks, I also want the session to be very interactive. If you have any questions, any suggestions, any feedback, put it up in the chat and I will take it up. Ankush says, great. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Right. So on that note, let me just go ahead and share my screen and, um, uh, we will start off with Java today. Adrish says I have basic understanding as I learned C++. That's good to know. Right. So folks, I have opened up Eclipse over here. So what exactly is Eclipse? This is just an ID. Now, if you work with uh, maybe C or C++, you would have had an ID called as Turbo C++ or Dev C++. So normally if we are working with any programming languages, so we would need an ID, which would just make the programming process very easy. So you can just consider this sort of to be an environment. And in this environment, you will write your entire code. So I've got Eclipse ready over here. Now what we'll do is, so I have something called as a source folder and this, what you see is your project. So I have a project called as Sparta and inside this, I have a source folder. Now, what I'd want to do is I'd right click over here and I'll go ahead and create a new package. So all I'm doing is you see this source folder. I'm right clicking this. If you're using a Mac, then just double tap it and new. I'll select a package and let me just go ahead up. Uh, I'll just call it Sparta again over here. Let me finish this off. So again, I have a package called as Sparta. Now I'll right click over here again and I would want a new class over here. And what sort of class is this? This is a public class. And I will also add some stuff. So these are basically some, uh, so what Eclipse helps you with this, so whatever boilerplate code is there, you can include them beforehand, right? So there are some method stops and one of the most important method stop is your public static void main. So you can consider this to be your main function in your class. So let's say if you have 10 classes out of those 10 classes, you will normally have just one main method for all of these 10 classes. And this is where all of your programming, your main programming would execute. So I've included public static void main and let me give in the name of this class over here. So let's call this something. Um, let's call this as my first Java program this is a really large class name but then again that's fine so i've created a class called as my first java program and this is the basic template and as you see this class is part of the sparta package now first if you don't understand what is public static void main ignore this for now as we go ahead in today's session we'll understand all of this properly now let's get to the fundamentals. So the fundamentals of any programming language is data. So if you're programming, you're essentially working with data, isn't it? Now you would have to store that data somewhere. So where do you store that data? That data goes into something called as a variable. 
Now, a simple example for this would be normally you have a lot of containers in your house, isn't it? Right. We'll have a lot of boxes. We'll have a lot of containers. And what you can do is you can go ahead and store something in that box. You can store something in that container. So simple example, let's say you go into your kitchen and uh, I have this one container. And what I do is I don't want to store a sugar packet inside that. So I'll just open a new sugar packet. I'll pour all of that sugar into that container. Now, once the sugar is done, probably I'd want to store uh, salt inside it. So once the sugar is done, I'll go ahead and store salt inside it. Similarly, let's say once the salt is done, probably I'd want a bit of pepper. I'll add pepper into it. So what you're doing is you are changing the values which are present inside this container. And this container is essentially your variable. So it is called a variable because the values which are storing inside it can change. And not just the values, the amount of the values itself. So let's say now your bucket can hold around maybe 500 grams of sugar, right? So or the bucket or the container or the box, it can, show, it can store at max. Its maximum capacity is around 500 grams of sugar. Now you can either store total 500 grams of sugar in it, or you can just store 250 grams or maybe even just store 100 grams of sugar in it. So here the value can change. So similarly, what we'll do over here is we'll go ahead and create our first variable and let's call this an integer variable. So I'll write down int a. Now, what is int a? A is a variable in which I can store integer values. So also you'd have to keep in mind that every variable has a data type associated with it. So here a is the variable and the data type associated with it is integer. Well, let me just go ahead and store a value inside this. So let's say I store the value of 10 and also keep in mind now if you work with Python, this might seem a bit different because in Python, you don't have to give semicolons after each code of line. But when it comes to Java, you'd have to end your each line or each code with a semicolon over here. So int a is equal to 10. Now that I have created this variable or declared this variable, I can go ahead and do something with it. Now, I just want to display this onto the console. So you have something called as system dot out dot print. So this is the command which you use to print something out on the console. Int a is equal to 10 system dot out dot print. And inside this, what I'll do is I'll just give in the variable. Now, when I execute this, let me run this again over here you will see that I have successfully printed out 10 onto the console. So folks, we have written our very first Java program. And in this, all we've done is created a very simple variable. There's an integer variable A, and I've stored 10 inside it. And when I've printed it out, you can see it on the console. So simple stuff. Let me see if there are any questions in the chat over here. Ankush Rati is asking, why do we use Java? Can we use other languages also for same work? Ankush, that is a really good question. And the answer is also yes. Right. Uh, so Java is mostly used for backend development. And if you're targeting uh, the SD roles, or if you want to be a full stack developer, then Java is a language which you can use. And there are also other languages which, which can do the same thing. Now, let's say if you're probably targeting the data science roles, then probably you can go ahead with languages such as Python or R. On the other hand, if you are targeting the SD roles or backend roles, then you can probably go with Java. And Java is also an evergreen language and you can do a lot of versatile things with Java. So the weapon of choice or the language of choice would boil down to you. Whatever language you're comfortable with, right? And whatever domain you've chosen, you can go ahead and pick that. And also it's not really necessary that, uh, you know, let's say if you want to become a software developer, it's not necessary that, you know, multiple languages, what is necessary that, you know, one language, one probably object oriented programming language, and you can implement the necessary tasks, right? So Java is only one language and you'd have to be able to, uh, you need the proper fundamentals, which should be the DS algo stuff, the operating systems, the networking stuff. And if you're good with that, and if you can implement that with any programming language, then you're good to go. So now, that we have uh, created a very simple variable and printed that out. Also, I've told you that a variable is a temporary storage space. Now, what I've done over here is I've just stored the value of 10 inside this. Uh, but what I want is I, uh, since this is a temporary storage space, I'll change the value which is present inside this. Instead of 10, let me change the value to be 20. And now when I run this, 
you will see that here in the console, I've printed out 20. Similarly, when I change this, let me have something called as 76. And when I run this again, you will see that I've printed out 76. So since a variable again is a temporary storage space, I can change whatever is stored inside this. And now let's do something different. So this is an integer type. Let's say if I want to print out a decimal value. So here, as you see, int a is equal to 76.12. So here you see this red line over here. And also you have this cross mark over here. And this, this is basically an error or a warning. And the warning is type mismatch cannot convert from double to int. Now, if I try to run this, let's see what happens. Here again, you see this. Errors exist in required projects. Sparta proceed with launch. Now, if I click on proceed, this is the error which you get. Type mismatch cannot convert from double to int. Now, this is happening because you're trying to store a decimal value into an integer type variable. So if you'd want to store a decimal type value, then you'd have to create either a floating point variable or a double type variable. Now, let me change this to float. So here I have float a is equal to 76.2 and let me add f over here, which would basically mean that this is a floating point number. Now, when I execute this, you would see that I have been able to successfully print out 76.12. So what I've done is I have created a decimal point value and I've stored that in a floating point variable. Now, similarly, if I want to store a character value, I will have something called as char over here, or maybe I'll just use string and I'll have a string a is equal to let me store a b c inside this and let me try to run this. And as you see, I've been able to print this out. So you will have different types of variables and all of these variables are associated with a data type. Now, this is the basic of every programming language, which is data types and variables. So now that we are set with this, we'll go ahead and look at something else. And that would be, um, let me add a comment over here. Let me write operators. So what exactly are operators? Well, simple stuff. With the help of operators, you can perform basic operations. Now, what are these operations? You can perform arithmetic operations. You can perform relational operations. And you can also perform logical operations. Now the first would be arithmetic operators. So in arithmetic operators, let me just extend this. Let me call this as arithmetic operators. And over here, I'll just put in certain values. So your arithmetic operators would be plus, minus, division, and multiplication. It's when you're adding two numbers, subtracting, dividing, or multiplying. These are your arithmetic operators. Now for this, what I would want to do is I'll create two variables over here and both of them would be integer variables. So I'll have int a and inside int a, I'll store the value 10. Then I will have int b and inside int b, I'll store the value 20. Now that I have created these two variables, I can perform the basic arithmetic operators. So I shall write down system dot out dot print and inside this, let me write the entire sentence over here. Addition of, and let me give in a space. Here I'll write a, again, a, and let me give in a plus symbol over here. And again, let me give in a space. Addition of a and b. Let me write down is, and then let me just write it down a plus b or let me have another variable called as c int c is equal to a plus b and over here at the final stage in the print statement i will give in c as well now if i run this you will see the result addition of 10 and 20 is 30. so here in the print statement so let's say if you'd want to directly display whatever string is there or characters are there directly onto the console you can put them up inside double quotes and if you'd want to display the value of a variable you can separate your string and the variable with a plus symbol so that is what i've done over here right so inside the double quotes i've given whatever i'd want to display onto the console which is addition of 
and plus a which is value of a which is 10. So addition of 10 and 20 is 30. Simple stuff. Now let me go back to the chat and see if there are any more questions. Um, so don't see any new questions over here. Um, so folks, again, um, I want this session to be quite interactive. Any questions, any suggestions, put them up in the chat and I shall definitely take them up. Also, if you are new to our channel and haven't yet subscribed, please click on the subscribe button. That will encourage us to put out more such content on a regular basis. And also, if you are uh, liking this content, uh, you can let your peers know, you can spread the word of mouth and let them know more about Scalar Academy's YT channel. So what we've done over here is um, we perform the addition operation. Now, similarly, let's say if you want to subtract these two values. So A is 10, B is 20. Let me perform A minus B over here. So A minus B, which would be 10 minus 20, which would be equal to minus 10. So here, let me just change this particular value over here. I'll call it subtraction. So the subtraction of A and B is, again, this will be C. The result is being stored over here. And now when I run this, this is what you'll see. Subtraction of 10 and 20 is minus 10. Next up, I'd want to multiply these two values. So here, I'll just have int c is equal to a into b. And here, let me just change this subtraction to multiplication. So multiplication of a and b is c. Now, let me run this again over here. And when I run it, you will see that multiplication of 10 and 20 is 200. Great. Next up, we'd want to divide these two values. So if I'd want to divide these two values, so int c is equal to, let me actually have b divided by a, that would be easier. So I'll call this b by a. Because 20 by 10, that would give me 2. And when I run this, this is the result which I get. So let me actually change this. So here I'd have to change the order. I'll call this as division of b and a is C. And now when I run this, you will see that division of 20 and 10 is 2. So what we've covered so far are arithmetic operators. Now let's go ahead and work with relational operators. So let me remove this over here. And in relational operators, you have something called as the less than symbol, greater than symbol, then you have the double equal to, and you have the not equal to. Let me just put them down over here. So this is greater than, then we have less than, then we have not equal to, and then we have double equal to. Let's start off by each of these over here. So less than, I'll just start off with the print statement. I'll write down system dot out dot print. And I would want to check if the value which is present in A is less than the value which is present in B. So I've written over here A less than B. So it's 10 less than 20. That is true. Now, when I execute this, let's see what would be the result. So when I execute this, we have a true value because 10 is obviously less than 20. Now, I'd want to check if the value which is there in A is greater than B. So it's 10 greater than 20. That is false. So when I execute this again over here, let me launch this. So now I get a false because 10 is definitely not greater than 20. Now going ahead, I do want to check if A is not equal to B. Now when I run this, you will see that this is true because 10 is obviously not equal to 20. And then going ahead, let me see if these are equal. Now you'd have to understand the difference between equal to and double equal to. So here, this equal to operator is the assignment operator, which would mean that I am assigning a value into this variable. So you see this variable A. Now into this variable A, I'm assigning this value of 10. Similarly, you see this variable B. Inside this variable B, I'm assigning this value of 20. But the difference between this equal to and double equal to is here. I'm not assigning the value of B into A. What I'm doing is I'm actually checking if the value of A is equal to the value of B. So this is something which you'd have to keep in mind. Now, when I run this, I will get a false result because 10 is obviously not equal to 20. So this is arithmetic operators. 
going ahead let me work with the logical operators let me change this over here logical operators and <clears throat> i will have and or and here let me create two boolean type variables i'll have bool a is equal to true then let me have bool b is equal to false let me write this as boolean let me write this as boolean over here as well let me put in a semicolon over here and now when it comes to the and operator and the or operator you'd have to understand that so if you're working with the and operator it will give you a true result when both of the operands are true else it will give you a false result similarly when it comes to the or operator it will give you a true result when either of the operand is true now let me start off with the and operator so here i'd want to check a and b so a and b true and false true and false let's see what do we get i get a false let me change this i'll have b and a b and a when i execute again i'll have a false let me have b and b so when i run b and b over here again i'll get a false so the only scenario where i will be getting a true result is a and a so a and a is in a sense true and true and since both of your operands are true over here i have got a true value and this is how your and operator works now let me go to the or operator so as i said or operator will give you a true result when either of the operand is true so here let me change this instead of double and let me give in two pipe symbols over here so a or a true or true is obviously true now let me have it as a or b and when i run this a or b is again true because true or false is also true let me go ahead and change this i will have b or a and when i have b or a again you will see that this is a true result because false or true is also true finally the only scenario where i'll get a false result is b or b and b or b again is in essence false or false and since both of your operands are false this is the only case where you'll be getting a false result so folks we have looked at all of these different operators which were the arithmetic operators relational operators and conditional operators so also if you are following till now just give me a quick thumbs up again and again if you have any questions put them up in the chat right so now that we have covered operators what we'll do is we'll uh, go a bit deeper into this and we'll start off with conditional statements in conditional statements we have something called as um, decision making statements and then we have looping statements in decision making statements you are making a decision uh, again on the basis of a condition so what is happening over here is if you'd see many real world scenarios to give you guys an example um let's say uh, your exams are coming up and uh, your parents do not allow you to watch your favorite tv series on netflix right so your parents tell you that if you score only about 95 marks in your math exam that is when you can go ahead and watch your favorite tv series on netflix now here what is happening is you your um, your aim or your um, final result of watching the netflix tv series is dependent on whether you score above 95 marks in math right so this is if else if marks greater than 95 then watch netflix if marks less than 95 then probably go back and study so if else right there would be a lot of if else decisions which you would have to make in the real life and that is what we are putting down over here i'll add the same thing over here um now i'll have something called as a inside a i'll store the value 20 again i will have int b inside this i'll store the value of 40 now i will use the if statement if a is less than b 
then I'd have to do something. If A is less than B, system dot out dot print, A is less than B. Now, when I run this, let's see what would be the result. So I get over here A is less than B because this condition which you see over here, now you'd have to remember that you can enter the body of the if statement only if this is evaluated to true. And since this condition is evaluated to true, which is A is less than B. So 20 is less than 40. This condition is true. And since this condition is true, you will enter the body of if statement and you will print this out. What are you printing out? A is less than B. Now, let me change this condition. Let me make this condition as if A is greater than B. Now, this condition will evaluate to false because 20 is not greater than 40. Now, if I go ahead and run this, you will see that I have not got any result because this condition is false. And since this condition is false, I will not enter the body of the SIF statement and I'll skip whatever is written inside here. So, if there are scenarios where even if the condition fails, I'd want to do something else, right? I do not want to print this, but I'd want to print something else. I'll write down else and inside the else body, let me go ahead and print if failed, that is why else is executed. Now, when I run this, you will see that this condition has failed. I will skip whatever is present inside this. I'll come to the else statement and I print it out. If failed, that is why else is executed. Now, let's do something interesting over here. So we have something called as the if else ladder. And to work with the if else ladder, I will have three numbers. Int A is equal to 20, Int B is equal to 40, and Int C I'll have as 60. So I have these three integer values over here, and with program or programmatically, I'd want to print out the maximum of these three values using the if else ladder. Starting, I'll use the if statement, and over here, I'll start off by checking if A is greater than B, and A is greater than C. If this evaluates to true, then I would want to print out system.out.print A is the greatest. On the other hand, right, if this evaluates to false, then I'll give in a new condition over here, and that condition would be if B is greater than C, and B is greater than A. Now, if B is greater than C and B is greater than A, what do I want to do? I would want to print out B is the greatest. And then finally, if this also fails, I will have one final else statement. And in this else statement, I'll go ahead and print System dot out dot print C is the greatest. Now, when I run this, let's see what would be the result. You will see that C is the greatest. And how have we got this result? Let's understand this logically or step by step. We'll start off with the if statement and we are checking this condition. So the condition is A is greater than B and A is greater than C. So is A greater than B? No, this is evaluated to false. Then we are checking is A greater than C. So is 20 greater than 60? No, this is also false. So false and false is evaluated to false. And since the entire thing is false, we will skip whatever is present inside here. And we will come to the else if clause. Inside this else if clause, we are checking if B is greater than C. So is 40 greater than 60? No, this is false. Then I am checking if B is greater than A. Is 40 greater than 20? Yes, that is true. In totality, what do we have? We have false and true. And false and true becomes false. And since the entire thing is false, again, I will skip this as well. I'll come down to the final else block. And whatever is present inside the else block, I'll just print this out. 
So this is a very simple logic to find out which of these is the greatest number. And we've done that using the if else ladder. So now that we've done this, let's go ahead and work with loops. So the if else statements were conditional statements. Now we'll work with looping statements. Again, I'll remove this comment over here and I'll have something called as looping statements. Just give me a second, folks. Let me go back to the chat. Um, so again, seems like there are no questions over here. Um, so folks, also, if you haven't yet liked the video, please do click on the uh, like button as if there are more people watching this. Again, more people will turn in and uh, that is how uh, the YouTube algorithm works. And if you're finding the session to be interesting, you can let your peers know, you can spread the word of mouth and you can ask everyone to come to Scalers YouTube channel and subscribe. Okay, great. Now, in looping statements, we have something called as the while loop and the for loop. Let's start off with the while loop. Again, if I would want to explain this with respect to a real world scenario, there would be certain tasks which you'd want to repeat again and again, isn't it? And now, Earlier, when I was telling you about variables, I told you that in a variable in a container, you can probably store uh, sugar, you can store salt, you can store whatever you have. Now, if I want to, let's say I have a container. Now, let's say that container is this big and you can fill up that container entirely with salt, but only with a spoon, right? You can't just take that entire salt packet and pour it to the container. So what do you do? You take your one spoon, you put that spoon into that salt packet, you take it and then you drop that one salt, uh, one spoon of salt into your container. Again, now that now once you put that, you will check if your container is full or not. Now when you're checking, it is obviously not full. You'll go back, you'll again take a spoon of salt from the packet, you will again drop it down into the container. Now what will you do? You'll again check if the container is full. So this process, you will keep on repeating again and again. So you will take that one spoon of salt, you'll drop it into the container. You'll take another spoon of salt, you'll drop it into the container and you will repeat that task until the container is full. So what are you doing over here? You are looping the same task or you are repeating the same task until a condition is met. And what is that condition? The condition is until the container is full with salt, I will keep on taking one spoon each from the salt packet and I will drop it down into the container. Now, I can do the same thing in Java language. So here, what I'd want to do is, let's say if I'd want to print out the first five numbers. So for that, I'll have a variable called as i. Let me initialize this variable i with one. Let me have something called as while. So this while, this is the syntax which you use for while loop. And I'll put in this parenthesis and inside this I will give in the condition. While i is less than or equal to 5. And this is the condition. Until this condition is being satisfied, I would want to do something. What do I want to do? System dot out dot print. I would want to print i. And I would want to increment the value of i as well. And now when I run this, you will see that I've been able to print out 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So what is happening over here? I will start off with this while loop. Initially, value of i is equal to 1. I will check if 1 is less than 5. 1 is less than or equal to 5. Is that true? Yes. Since that is true, I'll enter the while loop and I will print i. So i is 1. Then I will increment the value of i. I becomes 2. I'll go back and I'll check if 2 is less than or equal to 5. 2 is definitely less than 5. Again, I'll enter the while loop. I'll print out 2. Then I'll increment i. Now i becomes 3. I'll go back. I'll check if 3 is less than or equal to 5. So here again, I'll print out 3. Then I'll increment the value of i. Now this happens until i's value becomes 6. When i's value becomes 6, this condition is evaluated to false. So here you'll check if 6 is less than or equal to 5, this condition fails. And when this condition fails, you shall come out of the while loop. Now here, let's just do some basic variation to this here. You see that all of these numbers are, you know, they are sticking to each other. Let's say if I want to give a space, 
all I can do is let me just add in a space over here. And as you see, I've printed out one, two, three, four, five, and there is space over here. Similarly, if I want all of these in a new line, I can just use print ln instead of the simple print. And now when I run this, you will see that I've printed out one, two, three, four, five in a new row. And this is how you can work with the while loop. Going ahead, we have something called as the for loop. Now again, if, uh, before I start off with the for loop, just let me know in the chat if there are any more questions. So seems like uh, no one has any questions or suggestions. So folks, uh, I'm repeating this again. If you have any doubts, any suggestions, put them up in the chat. The aim of this live session is to uh, uh, properly interact with you folks as well, uh, to understand if you folks are following it or not. And if you have any questions, I am here to take them up. OK, uh, now going ahead with the for loop, I'll write down for. And now let me just give in the syntax for this. I'll have int i. Let me start off like this. Int i is equal to zero. i is less than or equal to phi i plus plus. Now, what am I doing over here? So here you have three things. First is known as initialization of the loop or initialization of the variable over here. When it came to the while loop, I had the int i at the top of the loop. Now here, I can initialize this variable inside the loop itself. So I'm initializing a value, and then you have the condition checking. Here I am checking if this value of i is less than or equal to phi, and then you have the incrementation option over here. So here I have written i plus plus. Now, for every iteration, what I would want to do is essentially the same print ln so this time instead of one to five let me go from zero to ten and let me print them in the same row so i'll have i over here and let me give in a space and when i run this you will see that i've printed out zero to ten let's understand this so for int i is equal to zero initially value of i is equal to zero and I will check if 0 is less than or equal to 10. This condition is evaluated to true. And since this is true, I'll enter this for loop. After entering this for loop, now, since that I'm inside this, I can just go ahead and print out this i. i is 0, I'll print it out. I'll go back, I'll increment i. i becomes 1. Now again, I'll check if 1 is less than or equal to 10. Since that is true, again, I'll enter the body of for, I'll print out 1. I'll go back, I'll increment the value of i, i becomes 2, and I'll check if 2 is less than or equal to 10. Since this is true again, I'll go back, I'll print out 2, and this process goes on until i becomes 11. When i becomes 11, this condition evaluates to false, and i exit the for loop. So this is your um, for loop over here. Now, going ahead, let's, uh, let's actually see your pattern problem maybe. Um, let's say I would want to print a triangle pattern where maybe I have, uh, you know, one star in the first row, two stars in the second row, three stars in the third row and so on. And for this, I will probably have a while loop. So, or maybe even I can have a for loop as well. So I'll have for int i is equal to zero, i is less than phi i plus plus inside this i'll have another for loop i'll have let me actually keep this as one int i is equal to one i is less than or equal to phi again i will keep this as int j is equal to one j is less than or equal to i j plus plus inside this what do i want to do i would want to let's say print out a star so I will have system dot out dot print and I will just print out a star over here. And after this, I will write down system dot out dot. I will keep this as println and I am printing out a new line. Now when I run this entire thing, let's see the result over here. So I've printed out five stars. Let's understand the logic over here. So this, we have two loops over here. These are nested loops. The outer loop will let you determine the number of rows and the inner loop will help you to 
perform what happens or execute what happens in each row so initially i have this variable i i is equal to 1 so you have row 1 so in your first row again you, what you are checking over here is i is equal to 1 is i less than or equal to 5 that is true since that is true you will enter the inner loop here again you initialized j with 1 and the condition is if j <coughs> is less than or equal to i so is 1 less than or equal to i 1 is definitely equal to 1 since that is true i'll enter the body of the inner loop and i will print one star now i will go back and increment the value of j j becomes 2 and when j becomes 2 when i compare if 2 is less than or equal to 1 this becomes false and i exit this inner for loop after exiting this inner for loop i'll just print out system dot out dot print ln so after printing a star i have come to the new line and after coming to the new line again i'll go back to the outer loop now in the outer loop i's value is incremented i becomes 2 here i'll check if 2 is less than or equal to 5 is that true yes that is true since that is true i can enter the body of outer loop and here in the inner loop i will check if j is equal to 1 is 1 less than 2 yes i'll enter this i'll print out a star right so one star is printed i'll go back j is again incremented j becomes 2 so is 2 less than or equal to 2 yes since this is true again i'll enter this body i'll print another star i have printed down two stars i'll go back when i increment the value of j it becomes 3 here when i check if 3 is less than or equal to 2 that becomes false and since that is false i will skip this for loop i'll come over here and i'll print out a new line and this is how I am able to print out one star in each row, right? Or one incremental star in each row. First row, one star. Second row, two stars. Third row, three stars, and so on. So this is a very simple pattern problem. Now that we are done with looping statements, we will go ahead and work with arrays. And let me just go ahead and see if there are any more questions in the chat. Tanu says, "Hey, Bharani Akila. Hey, Tanu. How are you doing?" Seshu says, "Looks good. We can proceed. Awesome, Seshu. Great. So now that we have worked with this, we will go ahead and work with arrays. Let me write down arrays, and after this, um, now again, if you work with variables, again, what happens with variables is you can store only one value at a time." now there'd be a lot of cases where you'd have to store multiple values isn't it so let's say if you have a class of maybe 50 students and you'd want to store the names of all of these students and the marks of all of these students you can't create variables for all of these right so 50 students you'd have to create 50 variables for the names of these students and 50 more variables for the marks of these students now that is a huge uh, you know you will have 100 variables and it becomes extremely difficult for you to keep track of all of them so here what you can do is we have something called as an array in which we can store homogeneous items or multiple elements of the same type so if if i do want to store marks of all of the students what i do want to do is i'll just create an integer array and i'll create the array of size around 50 since i do want to store 50 values so integer array i'll call it as marks and i'll go ahead and store 50 marks inside this similarly let's say if i do want to store uh, names i'll create a string array and i'll store 50 names inside this so let's see an example of this over here let's understand the syntax i'll write down int you see this this is how you create an array you'll given this square braces over here that is the parenthesis int a is equal to new int inside this let's say i'd want to create an array of size 3 maybe so i've written down int a is equal to new int and this array what you're doing is you're storing elements in contiguous memory locations and all of these contiguous memory locations can be accessed using an index and the first index value starts at 0 So your first element would be stored at index zero. Second element would be stored at index one. Third element would be stored at index two. Now, I've created this array. Let me go ahead and store some values manually over here, or let me just go ahead and hard code these values. 
I'll write down A0 is equal to 10. Then I will have A1 is equal to 20. Going ahead, I'll have A2 is equal to 30. I've created these three variables over here. Now let me just go ahead and print this out. Now if I want to print out this entire array at a single time, let me actually start a for loop. For int i is equal to 0, i is less than 3, i plus plus. And here I will use the print statement system dot out dot print. And what do I want to print? I would want to print a of i. So initially i value is 0. So I'm printing out a0. Then I'll print a1. Then I'll print a2. Now, again, let me give in a space over here so that I have proper spacing between all of the elements. So I've printed out 10, 20, 30. So folks, we have created our first array. This is an integer array. And size is three. I've stored three elements and I've printed them out. And now if I do want to take these values from the user, that is also something which I can do. So if you'd want to take inputs from the user, you would need the help of the scanner class, which is part of the util package. So all of your packages, if you'd want to include extra package, you can just write it down over here. So write down import java dot util dot star. Now that I've written this, I can just go ahead and create an object of the scanner class. So I'll have scanner sc is equal to new scanner. I'll write system dot n because you're taking input from the user over here. Now that I've written this, what I'd uh, want to do is, um, so I want three elements inside this, isn't it? So let me add a proper, uh, you know, proper uh, UI for this so that, you know, you will see that uh, uh, I'll have how many elements inside this, I'll take each element. So first I'll have system dot out dot print ln i'll write please enter how many values to be stored in array and whatever result i'll get so i'll have sc dot let me call this as next end so whatever value I'll get, I'll store it in something called as n. So the user will give in a value, which is the size of the array. And the size of the array I'm storing in this variable called as n. Now I will go ahead and create this array of size n. And I will not hard code these values. What I'll do is I will take these values from the user. Here, if I want to take the values from the user, again, I can go ahead and create a for loop. For int, i is equal to 0. Now, here, the condition would be i is less than n, i plus plus. And after this, what I'd want to do is, sure, I'll just have a of i is equal to sc dot next int. Now, once I store these values again, now before storing these values, let me add another print statement over here. So I'll have system dot out dot print ln. Please give in the individual elements in the array. So now that we have this, let me again add a new line before this as well. And we'll print this out. So this is also clear. I just need to give in a semicolon after this. So I've uh, stored the values inside this array. Now I'd have to go ahead and print out the values. So if I down to print out the values again, I'll go ahead and use a for loop. So to print out, um, so let me take in this for loop over here. I'll write down for int i is equal to zero. I is less than n. I'll write down i plus plus over here. And inside this, I would, uh, again, before this, let me add in another print statement. So I will have system dot out dot print. Let me keep it as print ln actually. And here I shall write down the values in the array are 
let me add in a new line after this as well. Let me give in proper spacing and let me do this. And here, since I'd want to print out the values, I'll just have system dot out dot print and I would want to print out A of I with proper spacing. And let me go ahead and click on OK. So please enter how many values are to be stored in the array. Let's say I'd want to store three values. I'll write down three over here. I'll give in the individual elements. Let's say the first element is 12. The next element is 23. The next element is 34. And as you see, I've printed out the values in the array are 12, 23, and 34. So I've got this in the next line. So let me remove this over here. Let me keep it over here. And this should work fine now. Instead of five, instead of three, maybe it, uh, I'll give in five over here. Now I'll have 12, 4, 67, 32, 9. So I've written down five values and as you see, I've printed out the values in the array are 12, 4, 67, 32, and 9. And folks, this is how you create an array. Again, give me a quick confirmation if you are following till here. All right, so we've created this uh, simple one dimensional array. Now, um, maybe what we'll do is since we have around five odd minutes left, let's just do, uh, let's just uh, look at one uh, final example of array. Maybe what we'll do is we'll create two arrays and we'll add the values in both of those arrays. So I'll have int a is equal to new int. I'll have uh, the size of three for this. Then I'll have int b is equal to new int. Again, I'll keep the size three for this. Now, whatever values are there in these two, I'd want to add them up and store in a new array. So I'll call this as int c. So int c is equal to new int. Again, the size would be equal to three. Now the size is set. I'd want to take in the values for these. So I would need the scanner class. So I will have scanner SC is equal to new scanner system dot in. This is set. So I've got the scanner class. I've got these three variables. Let me remove the spacing from here so that you can look at the bottom properly. So I've created these three arrays over here. What I'd want to do is I'd want to store values now. So I'll have for int i is equal to zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. And before this, let me add in a print statement, system dot out dot print. Let me keep it as ln. Let me write down ln over here. Inside this, I'll have enter values for array A and those values I shall be taking over here. So I will have A of I is equal to SC dot next int. So here I have <coughs> values of array A, I've taken them. Similarly, what I'd want to do is I'd want to take in the values for array B as well. So I'll just copy this over here, I'll paste it over here. Let me add in a tab. Let me add in a new line before this. So here I'll change this to be enter values per array B. And inside of, instead of A of I, I'll keep this as B of I. So B of I is equal to SC dot next int. So with this for loop, I'm storing values in array A. With this for loop, I'm storing values into array B. Now what I'd want to do is I'll have another for loop. And with that for loop, I'll add the values which are present in A and B and store them into C. So I'll write down for int i is equal to zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. And inside this, I'll have C of i is equal to A of i plus B of i. So very simple stuff. We've added the values. Now it's time to just print out the values. So to print out again, I will copy this entire thing. I will paste it over here and I'll change this. I'll keep it as values in array C are 
let me remove this. What I would need is a oh, print statement again, system dot out dot print, and I would want to print out C of I. This is set. Let me go ahead and run this. So first I need to enter the values in array A. So I have 10, then I have 20, then I have 30. Then I need to enter the values which are for array B. So let me keep it as 40, let me keep it as 50, and then I have 60. And as you see, let me drag this up over here. So in array A, I have 10, 20, 30. In array B, I have 40, 50, and 60. And in array C, I have values of 50, 70, and 90. And that is because 40 plus 10 is 50, 50 plus 20 is 70, 60 plus 30 is 90. And this is how we've been able to create two arrays, add the values which are present in both the arrays and store them in a new array called as C. So folks, I guess uh, this would be it for today's class. And uh, if you've liked this session, do like this video and also do not forget to subscribe to the channel. So on that note, I'm signing off guys and let's meet in the next one. Thank you very much.